Hey everyone, we are back for another session. I hope you had a really great time for this uh, AMA session. We had a lot of questions answered and uh, we hope it was really valuable for you. Um, now we are starting a new session with uh, Josh Bigford, who is the founder of Bear Metrics. It's a dashboard that gives you a real-time view into the major metrics that drive your business growth. So he will be talking to us today about how he's been growing his business entirely remotely. So it's very interesting to think about that and the fact that many startups start with like one, two or three people working. But what happens when you start growing and you want to keep this remote culture? So he's going to talk about growth, growing a remote business. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in uh, Josh to the screen, just very slowly here. Josh, you are now on screen and uh, I'm going to uh, put your slide up as well. And I want to remind people as well that if you have any questions, please ask them below in the Q&A session. The Q&A uh, section, yeah, please. So uh, we are ready to start. I have a really good time, uh, Josh, and uh, thank you for being here today. All right, good deal, good deal. Thanks for having me. Um, so nice to meet everyone, even though I can't see you. Um, today we're gonna talk about uh, growing a remote business. Um, and before I jump into all the, those bits, um, there's me, that's my face. Um, I'm the founder of Bear Metrics, Bear Metrics Revenue Analytics Platform, which, she just covered, so that's perfect. Um, a little bit about us from a remoteness standpoint. Uh, we're fully remote, so I, I personally am in Birmingham, Alabama, but I mean, I'm in my home office, junk and all. Um, and, but the whole team is spread across four uh, different countries. Um, for this talk in particular, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of the remote aspects of things, but I think at the end of the day, so like, when I, when I think of building a business, um, I think of uh, they're all kind of the same, like the, the being remote part, um, it matters, but it's like, it's a, it's just a different set of problems to, to tackle. It's not necessarily like a oh, remote's better or remote's worse or whatever. It's just like, you just have to solve problems differently. And some of these, like we'll talk about, you know, how to solve the remote aspect of that. But at the same time, I do think that, um, when it comes to just growing a business, like they're all just problems to be solved, remote or not. Um, so today we're going to talk about growing a remote uh, business or just growing a business in general. Um, and, and one thing I had uh, initially thought to name this talk was 37 bits of practical advice from the actual trenches of building a company so that you can stay sane and not hate yourself and or lose all your friends and family, but instead live a fruitful and productive life as an entrepreneur for many years to come. Now, that doesn't really fit, you know, in a little schedule, so I had to shorten it. Um, but that's that's the, the essential takeaway here. And we're going to do that across four uh, different topics. So people, business, product, and self. Um, and like I said, you know, some of these, there's, there's a remote aspect to all of these. But at the end of the day, like building a business kind of just comes down to people, which is that first topic there. And all of these kind of revolve around uh, the people aspect uh, of that. Um, but there are two takeaways like high level takeaways here or, or things to keep in mind. And that's that business is a marathon and not a sprint. Like these are all long-term, bigger idea kind of things here. Um, and also like, I want you to take away um, action here. Like that's the goal here is for you to, to be able to do something with these things. So uh, let's jump into that. So the first section, people. Um, that's hiring, firing, delegation, transparency, all that kind of stuff. Um, so first up is to hire a nerd uh, immediately. So Dave Ramsey, financial, personal finance guy, um, talks about uh, that in, in any relationship or in a marriage, for instance, um, one person's the nerd and one's the free spirit. So like in me and my wife's relationship, my wife is the nerd and I'm the free spirit. So um, she loves spreadsheets. She loves tracking our budget. She likes writing all that stuff down and I don't. Um, so when it comes to a business, um, that's a little, it's, you know, me not being like the, the, the financy kind of guy. Um, I'm the free spirit. Like I have the big ideas. Like I think, uh, I'm excited about new ideas in the future of our business. But when it comes to like the nitty gritty, like, does this number add up to this number? Does the budget balance? Like that's stuff that I have a really hard time with. Um, and actually this past 
June, um, so June 2016, we, we, their metrics almost ran out of money. So we realized we were about seven weeks away from uh, being completely out of money. Everybody can go home. We're done. We don't have any money left in the bank. Um, because I had kind of just like not really paid a whole lot of attention to the money side of things. So uh, thankfully, I hired a nerd. So someone who was able to dig into all the numbers and like forecast the upcoming months. Um, and so then I, as of this past January, we're fully profitable. Um, that's a whole other story in and of itself. But hire a nerd immediately, like somebody that can focus on all these small things. And especially when like when you're a remote company, um, it's easy to kind of like not have people around you in the literal sense, like, you know, in the desk next to you who can kind of like keep things in check. It's easy to like let things just float off. So hiring someone who can constantly be looking at the numbers um, is, is crucial. Uh, and you can hire like what would be considered sort of a freelance uh, or a part-time CFO kind of uh, person. So, which is what we do. Um, next is to hire slowly and uh, methodically. So you should resist the urge to hire. Um, I think like there's this feeling of like attaching success to growing the size of your team. Um, but in reality, like hiring is on some level, uh, a failure of efficiency. So you might like, instead of hiring someone, if you can figure out a way to do something more efficiently and not hire, uh, then like, that's the positive, um, the, typically the better route to go because you're not having to, to spend so much money. And that, that's the biggest expense of, I mean, just about any business across any industry, um, remote or not, is payroll. And so you should resist the urge to hire as, for any position as long as humanly possible. Now, the inverse of that um, is to fire quickly, but with kindness. So, um, so if we're talking about firing here, like if you ever start thinking, I wonder if I should fire this person or if you should let this person go, like you probably should have already done it. Um, but when you fire someone or when you let somebody go, uh, you should also um, not be like cold and um, like stone faced about it. Like you should, you should do it with kindness and, um, and understand that in, the, in reality, in most cases, having to fire someone is not the person being fired's fault, it's your fault. Like you can avoid firing people by hiring appropriately. And if you, if you hire slowly, like which is the, the previous point, um, you reduce the need to fire people at all, uh, or at least as frequently because you spent more time making sure that the, someone is the right fit for the right role. Um, so I, to me, like firing people um, ultimately is, is something like that's my fault that you know, I should have uh, noticed the problem sooner, or maybe they should have been hired to begin with. Um, next up, so fighting the urge, you should fight the urge to, to spin more plates. So as um, whether you're a founder or not, um, somebody who just makes things, um, there is this urge to just do all the things. And busy, the, the, like busy doesn't equal productive, but it feels like it does, right? So there's the feeling that like, well, if I'm doing things constantly throughout the entire day, maybe I'm working 10, 12 hour days because there's just so much to do. Um, you're probably doing lots of things that you don't actually need uh, to be doing. Um, and that's, you know, whether you should be hiring someone else to be handling those things, or a lot of times, especially early on, you shouldn't be doing those things at all. Like there's just not any need to be doing a lot of those tasks. Um, you should just be focusing on growing your business. Um, next is to uh, focus on your strengths uh, and then delegate your weaknesses. So um, like I just mentioned, like as a founder or just like a maker of things, um, you're probably pretty good at figuring out how to do things. Um, if you've started a business, much of starting a business is just being like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out. And so then you end up having this urge to do that for everything. And so then you end up doing a lot of things not very well, um, and, but instead you should be like delegating the things that you aren't good at. So after you first pinpoint um, the things that actually need to get done to grow your business, you also need to then focus on like, what can I not do? Um, the, what can I not do that I'm already not very good at? And instead focus on uh, the things that I am really, really good at. And I think like after, I don't know, building businesses for like 15 years here, 
the, if anything, I've learned that I'm, I'm not, there are very, very few things that I'm actually like really great at. Um, so I've kind of figured out the few, very few things that I am really good at. And that's what I focus on everything else, like gets pushed off to someone else who is really great at it. Um, next is uh, don't hide things from your team. So I think there's a, um, a lot of, um, there's, the, there's the feeling that like you need to be, especially if you're the founder, like the, the, the rock, like the person who's um, got it all together so that your team like doesn't freak out about things. But I mean, remember, you're all adults. Um, and when you, when you keep things from your team, um, I think it ultimately breaks down trust and people then start worrying about more things than they need to. Like when something bad does happen and you do tell them about it, um, if you haven't been really forward about it um, historically, then uh, they'll start thinking lots of little things are also bigger things. Like, oh, I wonder if Josh is hiding that because uh, we haven't ever really talked about things before. Um, so try to be like as open and transparent with your team as possible. Next up. So business stuff here. Um, so first up uh, is maintaining the power to walk away. So whether you're negotiating a business deal or um, like looking at raising um, money or anything like that, um, you should always maintain the power to walk away. You should always be the person in control. You never want to be um, in a spot where like you absolutely desperately need, say, a, a VC's um, funding or uh, you absolutely need some business deal to go through because then you're sort of forced into making uh, or taking on something that isn't in your best interest because you waited too long to do it or you uh, worked yourself into a position where you basically have to take whatever deal is thrown at you. So maintain the power to walk away. Um, talking about investors here. So I think investors are uh, great for optimizing companies, scaling them, um, they're not great for product advice. Like that's not, their goal isn't for you to have some great product. Um, their goal is to make your company as big um, and in, in a lot of cases, like have as much revenue uh, as possible, which isn't everybody's goal, right? Like um, I don't necessarily want to have a massive, massive company with like thousands of people. Like that's not my end goal. So that's not to say this isn't a comment about like investors are bad or anything, but uh, I think there's a time and a place for it. Um, and so keep that in mind um, that investors are, can be really great if you are trying to scale up something, um, but not in the product sense. Um, so you'll burn through, this is the next point here, you'll burn through all your funding in a year. Now I say funding here, um, I think, so like that's in a literal sense, yes. Like if, you've, if you raised, um, any amount of money, you will spend it all within 12 to 18 months. And that's why it goes back to hiring being, hiring slowly being really important. Um, that also being said though, say you haven't raised any money, um, but you just have a lot of money in the bank. So maybe you've saved up a lot of money from just the profits from the business, which is great. Um, what'll happen though, is like that big chunk of cash sitting in the bank um, will start burning a hole in your pocket. And you'll feel like, well, I've got, I don't know, maybe you've got $100,000 that you've saved up from the profits from the business. Uh, and then you'll start getting like this itch to spend it. Um, so fight really hard to not just spend all that money. Like keep as much money in the bank as you can and just um, operate off of your profits each month. Each month. Next up is to um, ignore data early on. So like if you've just launched some product, the, the, the phrase A-B testing should not be in your vocabulary. Like you don't have enough traffic or conversions or anything like that to even care about the A-B testing. Um, when it comes to software, for instance, like there's the, and this is a concept outside of software too, but churn. So that's basically like customers that are leaving. Um, what I'll see a lot of times with bare metrics. So like we service software companies who have uh, recurring revenue. So, you know, maybe somebody pays a hundred bucks a month, every month. Um, and there's a thing called churn here where it's like, you know, if you've got 10% churn, that means one out of every uh, hundred, I mean, one out of every 10 people leaves or cancels. But what we'll see is like, somebody will be like, my churn's 30%, which is a really bad number. I mean that, you know, um, that's three out of every 10 people leaves and eventually 
within just a few months, all of those people will be gone. But like the problem is when you've got 30% churn and then like four customers, like it just doesn't matter. The churn rate itself doesn't matter. The data in and of itself doesn't matter. You need to be focusing on growing the business as a whole. So um, you need a bigger top of funnel, really. Um, next thing to ignore here is competition. So the problem, um, when you're launching anything is like, you want to go and see what everybody else is doing and you'll get focused and obsessed with what other people are doing uh, in your space. Um, and maybe it's like a direct competitor when you start following them and like, you know, you'll see people who it's like they're following their competitors on Twitter. They're, they've got like Google alerts set up for any mention of their competitor's name. They've got Twitter searches set up for any mention of their competitor's name and, and they get obsessed with like wondering what the competition is doing and wondering what um, customers are doing in regards to the competition. Are they talking to them or talking about them? Uh, but the problem when you get obsessed with your competition is that you're perpetually one step behind. You're always being reactive uh, instead of proactive. And I think it's really important to remember that your customers aren't necessarily also your competitors' customers. And the, the inverse of that is true as well. That the, the people that are using your competitor aren't necessarily also going to be using you. You're solving on some level different problems um, or you're solving them in different ways. And instead of wondering how you can get customers from your competition, you should instead focus on how can we serve our current customers who are using our product really well. And that just sort of expands and brings in new customers who are like-minded. Um, next up is to not build internal tools. So um, there's an urge to be overly frugal with money. Um, and you forget that your time uh, has huge value as well. And especially if like either you're a developer or you've got somebody on, you've got a developer on your team, there's this feeling of like, oh, we can't spend a hundred bucks on that. Like we don't have the profits for it yet. Um, so we'll just build it internally, which on the outside, like that sounds reasonable, but then you forget that your, the, the, your engineer or you, like that your time is really valuable. Um, and the danger when it comes to building internal tools is not, is not that it saves an insignificant amount of money, I mean, like a hundred bucks a month in the grand scheme of things is not that much. Um, so it's not that it saves an insignificant amount of cash, but it's that it stifles future growth. So if you spend a month building some internal tool just so you can save a hundred bucks a month, um, you have not only, only saved a small amount of money, you've also delayed or just missed out on lots of future income as well because you weren't spending that time uh, growing the business itself. Um, next up is don't wait to charge money. So you're not, you're not running a charity here. Um, you need, like what, what a lot of times people do is like they'll launch a free product because they want, they think like, oh, I'm gonna get feedback here from like our free beta or whatever. Um, but the fact is feedback from people who aren't paying you will always be different than the feedback from people who are paying you. Because one, one person's not invested at all. They've literally put nothing into your product. Whereas the other is. They've put money in and they hope to get something back and they hope to keep getting something back. So you need to be charging, uh, if not from day one, very early, uh, there, shortly thereafter. Um, next is don't listen to uh, user feedback on pricing. Instead, listen to user action. So um, what happens here is like, a lot of times you'll get feedback when it comes to pricing on things as, oh, it's too expensive. But um, that's great. Like that feedback on pricing is great for understanding how a user thinks about pricing. But at the end of the day, it's not all that great for understanding what they actually do about the pricing. Everybody would love to get something for cheaper, so they'll never say, I say they'll never say. Most of the time they, will, they won't say like, yes, charge, charge me more. Like you're charging 100 bucks a month now, you should be charging me 500 bucks a month. Um, most won't say that. Uh, they'll ask for it to be cheaper. But if you hold to your pricing, um, what will happen is like you'll get people at the higher price point um, if you're actually solving a real problem and um, there'll be those, those kinds of customers like want to use your product because they're, again, they're invested. Whereas somebody who's paying like five bucks a month 
I just don't really care. Um, and kind of bouncing off that. So a $9 a month customer is an entirely different customer than a $99 a month customer. Um, all price points are in no way created equally. So uh, the $9 a month customer, um, there's this concept of, of a thing called average revenue per user. So that's how much money you're making on average from all your customers. So customers, if they're on average paying you like a single digit amount, uh, tend to be really price conscious and they care like, if, if a product goes from like $4 a month to $9 a month, they freak out over this $5 difference, which is insane, right? But they're extremely price conscious and any little, like it will be very hard to make more money from them down the road. Whereas a um, $100 a month customer generally uh, is not all that price conscious. They're just, they're, they, they understand the concept of spending money to solve some problem for them so that they can make more money down the road. Um, next up, uh, inbound, uh, marketing trumps outbound marketing in any sort of effort I mean, marketing or sales really. Uh, so that's like inbound would be like content marketing, word of mouth referrals. Um, so these are all great ways to get inbound traffic. And so then that traffic is, uh, from people who are, have some sort of interest already from the beginning in your product. Like they've had some other either content or person um, that's not you or your company that uh, is bringing them in. And so they're, they've expressed some interest just by like viewing the content, for instance. Um, whereas with like outbound sales, I mean, if we're being honest, like no one actually enjoys the outbound sales process, either actually doing the outbound sales or being on the receiving end, right? Like I mean, I get, I get cold calls every day from people trying to sell me something and that's not enjoyable for anyone. So the more you can increase the inbound marketing and sales, uh, the easier it will be to just convert people in general. Um, and also, I mean, jumping off the sales thing. So the next point here is that sales solves all things and not necessarily a sales process solves all things. Um, it's just that like, making more money, like money, revenue, profit solves all things. Um, almost any business problem that you've got is solved by making more money. Uh, and that's not like in like this greedy sense. It's just, you generally need money to be able to keep things running or to make money. Um, so sales solves all things. Um, and then when you're selling, you need to sell painkillers, uh, and not vitamins, like selling things that are just sort of nice to haves, um, will be extremely, um, difficult. Like you're, the, the bucket will always leak faster than you can fill it up when you're selling vitamins and not painkillers. Um, next section here is product. Uh, so talk to your customers with words from your mouth and out loud. Um, talking to humans can be really scary. Um, especially if you're like maybe an introverted type who just doesn't enjoy being around people, totally fine. Um, but the way that you get the most actionable feedback is to actually talk to customers, like talking to them on the phone or grabbing lunch with them or coffee or whatever, like talk, actually having a conversation gets you feedback uh, in a way that um, like a feedback form on your website just doesn't give you. Um, people are much more open to telling you the exact reasons they do or don't like something about what it is you're doing uh, when they're actually talking to you in person. Um, so the next thing here is, uh, the next feature fallacy, um, is real and will cloud your thinking dramatically. So the next feature fallacy, uh, here says that the, essentially the thinking is like, oh, if I just get out this next feature or we put out this next piece of content even, um, or, you know, this next book, whatever it is, um, the thinking is like that once we do that, something crazy will happen and we'll grow a ton. Like this is the, like, here's our ticket to, to growth. Um, and here's a little chart that explains some things. So this, uh, this chart here is the monthly recurring revenue from bear metrics. Um, let's see, when was this up to? So it was like a, maybe January or something. Um, but what you're looking at here are the, so there's these gray bars, these line vertical lines, uh, that line up to these little speech bubbles at the bottom. Little speech bubbles are annotations, which, correspond to us launching some new feature. Um, and this is almost back to the beginning. So 
like you, what you'll see here is there's a lot of vertical lines. Like you've launched a ton of stuff, but then the really frustrating part is that none of them changed the, gra the graph. Like nothing all of a sudden got this like hockey stick growth because we launched something. Um, it's not that those things weren't necessary. It's just building things is just like, it's the, it's the, the result of lots of compounding things. Like all of these things together make bare metrics more valuable uh, and help us grow long-term. Um, but any single feature, any single product launch, uh, generally speaking, will have very little effect uh, on your actual revenue or growth. Next up is uh, to not build solutions that are in search of a problem. So just because like you had an idea doesn't mean that someone else needs it, right? Um, the mere existence uh, of the solution that you've got in mind doesn't validate the existence of a problem. Um, not all customer feedback is equal. So this is kind of what we talked about before. Um, feedback from free users uh, can be very misleading because it's not, you want feedback from, um, from paying users, right? Feedback from really angry or uh, problematic customers can also be misleading because it's not the kind of customer that you want. So you want to prioritize perfect customer feedback. Um, next up is to try, stop trying to attain the perfect product. So Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn um, says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you have launched too late. And there's this the idea or like you want to put in all this effort to like polish and have the, this amazing product, but there's diminishing returns there. So the details matter, but um, shipped is a lot better than perfect. Um, constantly reevaluate your product. So tracking um, product usage or tracking, um, you know, what content is doing really well. Um, you need to constantly be working on those things and then like getting rid of the things that don't bring value uh, and aren't uh, used a lot. Um, next up is to not make assumptions. So actually tracking those things uh, instead of just being like, you know, I feel like people might not be using it, you know, like you need to know that people aren't using something or know that people are using something. Um, next is using revenue to guide product development. So as a business, you need money to stay alive. Um, and when you don't know what to work on next or what thing you should put out next, um, use revenue and things that can bring in revenue as a guide to help you uh, figure out what you need to work on next. Um, and then next up is a question to ask yourself. So that's, do you have a product problem or a distribution problem? So um, as makers, uh, we think that we can like build our way to success or produce our way to success. But the reality is you have to sell and market uh, your way to success. So a buddy of mine, Nathan Berry at ConvertKit, um, which you can see his numbers, at any time, convertkit.bearmetrics.com. And what you see here is like in September, 2015, uh, there's a big change in how much money they were making. Uh, and that change was not a product change. That change was a marketing and a sales change. They changed how they marketed the product and it had, I mean, substantial effects. So um, yes, do you have a product problem or a distribution problem? Uh, you probably have a distribution problem. Uh, and last section here is yourself, taking care of yourself here. So startups are like kids. Um, my daughter and I were talking the other night and she asked, she said, dad, like, what's the hardest part of being a dad? And I said, I said, the hardest part is that you're not a robot. Um, and I was joking with her, but I mean, what I meant by that was it's hard because you don't know what kids are going to do. You don't know what startups are going to do. You try to control for all the variables. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like things are going to happen the way that they're going to be, they're going to happen. So don't be too hard on yourself. So this is an interesting slide here uh, for a, a conference. Um, so conferences and networking events are usually a waste of your time. Um, and which is less so for this kind of thing where it's like remote and you can get back to work afterwards. But Ultimately, like the real value is in talking to people outside of those specific events, right? Um, so next is optimism is a crutch. So you should be a little doom and gloom. So running through worst case scenarios uh, can help you prepare for the worst. Um, don't play startup. So it's easy to read all the articles um, and get caught up in the hype. Um, but instead of like playing startup, you should actually work on building your business. Um, next up, and we're getting close to being done here. A couple more slides. 
um, get friends who aren't entrepreneurs. There's uh, the startup echo chamber is real and um, you should be surrounding yourself by, with people who are not in the same echo chamber as you so you can get new and fresh ideas. Um, and then actually we're gonna skip a couple of slides here. Um, and next is to take time off. Um, so vacations are really crucial here. Um, so like what happens is like you're working on something, maybe you work on something for a really long time and then um, you know, you're having trouble figuring out the solution. Then you go to lunch and you come back and it's like, oh, the solution's obvious. Vacations are that, but like on a really large scale and they're super important. Um, I mean, we're talking like take, take a good week off uh, every few months at least. And then um, next to last here is to make inspiration strike. So there's this quote here by Somerset Maugham who says, I write only when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at nine o'clock sharp. So like you just have to show up and do the thing. Even if you don't know what to do, just start. Um, don't attach your own self-worth to your company. So a lot, an unbelievable number of founders, myself included, have struggled with uh, depression and anxiety. A lot of that revolving around um, attaching your self-worth to your company and its success and its ups and downs. And you have to find other things to attach your self-worth to. And finally, last point here, that everybody's winging it. So every single person, Every one of us here uh, has no idea what we're doing. No clue. Um, we might have hindsight, but like, that's it. Otherwise, we just don't know what we're doing. And that's all I got. So there's my info if you need to contact me, josh at bearmetrics.com. And uh, that's all I got. Thank Thanks you for so listening. Much. Thank you so much. Uh, josh, you can uh, stop sharing your screen so you can see all of us. Uh, I'll bring myself uh, there as well and create this one. Hey, it was really, Hello. really awesome. Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, really great, great insight. It's just, I mean, as a product, I'll post it as well. This was very interesting. Uh, people are very excited. You can see the chat. People are all typing and really excited about it. So thank you so much for, um, for giving this talk and really having a more of a business topic. It was really interesting to me just talk about business for, uh, for once, you know, <laughs> what, what, what yeah. we're doing with our business. <laughs> So uh, we have a little bit of time left, so we went a little bit over, but I really want you to finish because I, I knew that uh, you had things, great things to say and people were all excited. So uh, let's go ahead and go um, answer some questions. So I have one first question who was from Bianca and she's asking, how is the legal relationship between remote companies and remote workers? Um, do you see sign interna do you sign international contracts? How are tax managed in the remote company? What is a, it? What if a team member does not meet uh, with the deadline? So it seems this is a question that comes back a lot. So um, how do you deal with that? So I mean from a practical standpoint um, So we have separate contracts between uh, international employees and then domestic here in the United States. So um, from a Legal standpoint and a tax standpoint, international employees are treated as contractors. Um, that's the only, like it's a paper difference that the, within the company as far as what benefits, uh, uh, so that's even like the wrong word. There's so many like technical terms here. Like um, we treat international employees the same in all regards except for the, the contract. One talks about them being a contractor, another one talks about them being an employee. Um, so we do sign contracts though. Um, Taxes wise, I mean, we have a CPA who handles all the tax stuff because especially here in the States, like will make your brain explode. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even, I try to not think about it because I know there's just no way for me to like wrap my brain around it and still run a company. Yeah. Um, the, the point about like, what if a team member does not meet a deadline or just disappears? I don't, I think that's a hiring problem. Like that's something that should have been addressed or filtered on uh, day one. Like that's not really something that you handle after someone's already been hired. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, other question now is from Robert. What do you think of sites like freelancer, Upwork, people per hour to get started as a remote worker? Uh, can anyone truly start on Upwork? If you want to enjoy the lifestyle of remote work, you need to have a good income for good work. So uh, are there other sites you recommend for paid, a better paid job on, on my behalf? I talk about technically more in depth writing, a reliable VA, et cetera. Thanks. Um, so to me, like, 
if I'm, under, if I'm understanding correctly, like Robert's asking, how can he get into remote, like being a remote worker? Well, I guess uh, the website, there's a website that exists kind of called Upwork. So when, I don't yeah. know, so yeah. So, you know, many people are using this right now to kind of get their first jobs or to hire also people there. So you want to know their, your opinion about that. About So, that, I mean, I, you know? yeah, I don't, I mean, if it works, it works. Like, I think um, it's just, it's a different way to, I think like, if you're trying to find work through those, you'll find basically like the lowest paying work possible. There's way you can certainly make more money not going through those. Um, if you're going to hire people and you're looking for remote workers, um, I think that going through those is still, um, that's kind of a hard sell too, like, because you're finding people who maybe don't understand as much like the value proposition that's going on. Like there's just an imbalance I find um, with using those kind of, sites that puts way too much uh focus on the um the outcome um uh, just like the pure single like outcomes instead of like something being done with like really high quality for instance um or somebody that's like you can't think of the bigger picture a lot of times through those kind of methods that's just right. my experience All right uh another question from noel here um is being retweeted by large accounts, being on, at the top of a hacker news, getting media mentions that all, are all overrated? Uh, do online founders focus too much on such occurrences as a metric of success? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, all that stuff's overrated in the individual sense. So one guy retweeting, one like really large Twitter account retweeting you or something or mentioning you or getting something at the top of hacker news like, these things um, in and of themselves are very tiny blips on the radar. Like it just, at, in the grand scheme of things, like you might see a little uptick, but it, uptick, but it just doesn't matter uh, in the big picture. Um, like you need to be focusing on like larger scale things that, um, like if it's a content play, for instance, you need to be focused on like writing really, really, really great content, period. And then if uh, the Hacker News community or product hunt or whatever it is that you're like, you're trying to launch something, um, content or otherwise, uh, like latches onto that. Cool. Great. Fantastic. It's an added benefit that doesn't hurt, but, um, focusing just on those things, uh, is really distracting and, and usually is a massive waste of time. Right. And what would you do exactly like on, I mean, from your experience, what was the most successful part? Or the, the, the content part of just like being consistent, like yeah. producing a ton of stuff. And we've, we've been producing stuff for three years on the content side of things. Um, and it's not a, like content marketing is a, is the long game that takes mm -hmm. forever to like have paybacks from like, we've been on the top of Hacker News for both content stuff and uh, product stuff a dozen times. And sure, like you'll get little bumps, but like it just doesn't, in the grand scheme just doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm what matters is the fact that like people reference, like they'll say like, oh, I just spent the last two hours reading every blog post on bare metrics. And it was super helpful. Well, that, that's because we've got like a hundred articles there. Mm. Um, so it's just, it just takes time uh, right. producing the really good stuff. One last question. Uh, we have one minute left is what was your biggest challenge to grow a remote business? Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge with when it comes to growing a remote business um, is ultimately like, it's, it's a people thing. Like it's, um, and, and it's the communication part, like figuring out, well, how do we communicate in a way that works for the team as a whole? Um, because communicating in person is entirely different than communi than communicating with a remote business spread across, you know, a bunch of different time zones. Like that stuff's difficult. It's not impossible by any means. It's just, it just, the, from a challenge perspective, it's just like making sure that you communicate well in a way that like doesn't, overwhelm people or require them to be around all the time or work crazy hours. Like it's just finding a system that works for the team mm. as a whole. That's good. And thank you so much. Everything you've been sharing us for us today has been so valuable. I can already see people interacting a lot in the chat. And thank you so much for spending the time coming here and share your knowledge about their metrics and what you've been learning in your, in your journey. So, um, I'd like to go ahead and I will move to the other session. So thank you so much, Josh, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. All right, thanks so much. Bye, thank you.
So I'm going to go ahead and change session for the next session with Lara Owen from GitHub. So see you in five minutes.